Her name is Lois Dott, and she is the co-founder of Citizens for Prison Reform, a statewide grassroots organization in Michigan that supports, educates, and unifies family, friends, and citizens seeking reform of the criminal justice system. She's a frequent and public a frequent public speaker and commenter on a range of issues affecting people who are incarcerated, especially regarding their mental health needs. In 2009, she was awarded the National Mother of Distinction Award by the Campaign for Youth Justice and the National Juvenile Justice Network. But most recently, she served as the administrator with as an administrator with the Association for Children's Mental Health. She was also recently awarded an Open Society Foundation Fellowship to implement the Family Participation Program that she'll be speaking about today. We'll open up the session to questions in the chat room at the end of the presentation, but feel free to submit any questions during the presentation. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and get uh, turn it over to Lois to get us started. Lois, take it away. Hello there, Hello there everyone. everyone. Welcome. I thank you for joining us. And of course, we're all on the call today because we have great interest in moving family engagement forward in whatever area we're working in. I do want to mention that currently my work is focused within the adult prison system primarily here in Michigan. I do assist families that call that have someone in the juvenile or the jail system as well, but I just wanted to point that out to you. Um, I really did not blossom in, in the field of family engagement until my son was in the adult system. My experience on the forefront um, all of the time that he spent, the years that he spent in the juvenile justice system, I really hadn't quite figured a lot of things out. And um, some of those things I'm going to talk about today, the pitfalls that we can avoid both as families, as organizers, and as systems. So I think one of the very first things that we really have to stop and recognize in whatever role that we play is just how um, great the impact is of any type of incarceration um, you know, the, the impact that it plays not only on that youth that winds up in the system, but the entire family unit and also the children that are still within the home. And that we really need to recognize that it calls for support and not isolation and shame. As each family comes into the system to, to really look at their unique experience and to recognize that each one of them brings something, um, their own perspective to the table that we all can learn from and that we can gain from. Uh, the thing that, that I didn't realize early on with my son being in, in the juvenile system was just um, the trauma the shame, the anger, the guilt, and really the deep pain that um, lied within, you know, the deepest part of me. And in, in not having the supports in place to be able to recognize that, it often sh shifted and played out as projected anger um, to those that were working in the system. And unfortunately, one of the big mistakes that I made was working alone, and that is not something that I all recommend that families do. You really need to um, network and build a, a organized um, system around you to offer the support that you need. Um, but often, I think, as systems um, and even agencies, there is not the recognition of um, the trauma that occurs not only for the individual, the youth who's in the system, but the extended family dealing with the media. Um, often some of these cases are highly publicized. And then also just the financial and emotional burdens that come into play with having to travel and the visits and the court costs, and it all just becomes overwhelming. And often I think um, there's a sense of feeling um, for families that it's um, 
us against them. It's the families against the system. And I think we've really got to work to break that down. So I think offering families just the support and helping them to understand that we are here to assist, whether we're system-driven, grassroots organizations out in the community, that we are in this together. We need to be able to recognize and name the struggles that each family is facing. Every family, again, has their unique case, and often we're just seen almost as a number and each one of us have individual needs and individual crises that we're facing as we walk through um, our youth being put into the the um, juvenile justice system. And I think the other thing frequently that I have to remind families of is that doing nothing will result in nothing. It's it's often um, easy for families to to think that they cannot make a difference. And I know early on this was what I thought. I thought that this was a big, powerful system and that I didn't have a space to be able to um, advocate or to be able to use my voice. And so I frequently remind families, if we do nothing, nothing will change. So whatever amount of effort they can put into advocating or working on change within their family unit, certainly it's better than nothing. I want to share just a little bit of my backstory with you so that you can understand what really has driven me um, and also just um, some of the big aha moments where I really started to get and understand the power of family engagement. So this is my son, Kevin. Kevin, um, we saw from a very young age of three and four, had um, severe emotional impairments, and we started seeking help for him at that time. By the time that he was 11, he was diagnosed as bipolar, and he had actually been um, in psychiatric hospitalization. He had been he had his first day in the juvenile detention facility at the age of ten. Yet we didn't qualify for in-home services, and so I think that right there uh, created that sense of us against them and feeling like the supports were not in place. At the age of thirteen, Kevin committed a crime. He went into a Little Caesars pizza store, was driven there by strangers that he owed money. And he went in to um, rob the store. He had a toy gun. He got scared and he ran out. He didn't take any money. But in Michigan, they uh, gave him a blended sentence and charged him as an adult at the age of 13. He then was sent um, for the third time out of state And when he failed that program that wasn't set up to take children who have bipolar diagnoses, he then was sentenced into the Michigan Department of Corrections. So here's the photo of him that was taken by our local paper the day that he was sentenced at the age of 15, and he was 15 by two months. He's in a Bam Bam suit. We hadn't been able to see him for weeks. We didn't know why the jail wasn't communicating with us, even though he was a minor. And again, part of that was because I was working alone and because I I had so much anger that was spilling out and often um, harmful rather than helpful. But he had actually been attempting to slit his wrists, and so they brought him to court in this Bam Bam suit. And the and, um, newspaper was there and captured this photo, and that in itself was extremely traumatic uh, just to have to experience that. The judge had told us that day that he would get the mental health helps he needed inside the adult prison system. And yes, in Michigan, we send our juveniles into the adult prison system when they have an adult sentence. Once he um, was inside the system, he could not um, conform to the standards of the Michigan Department of Corrections. He had numerous breakdowns, and he wound up being put in with the most mentally ill Um, seven months after he went into prison. And there he started reaching out and asking me as a mom to advocate for these other juveniles. And I have, 
you see here two letters from juveniles that were also in the adult psychiatric prison. They were being held in isolation. And it this led to me rising up and for the first time realizing that I had to organize and I had to bring people together. So we um, made a decision to do a letter writing campaign around these juveniles. And there were approximately about five of them total that that we found, and I started assisting and teaching their families what little I knew, but it was more than what they knew. And so that was really the beginning of of, um, family empowerment and engaging families and understanding um, that we could make a difference. The amazing thing was it was recommended. I had found an organization in Michigan who did direct prisoner advocacy work, and they highly recommended that we not we not do this letter writing campaign. They said that it could bring retaliation, that there could be severe ramifications for him. And I made that decision. I thought long and hard about it. And I organized, mainly at that point it was family, and we had family out of state. So we had about 75 who participated in this letter writing campaign. And we kept sending in letters to the Department of Corrections and to our government officials, to the governor and legislators. And amazingly enough, what came out of that was my son actually being released from prison. Um, He was released to the first minor in the state of Michigan at age 17. Now, his story is very complicated, and I cannot go into a lot of the details of everything that occurred Um, or we would be on the phone for days. But what I can tell you is that we never made the letter writing campaign about my son. We made the letter writing campaign about the general issue of the juveniles who were inside this adult prison system that we knew were in long-term isolation, not getting the treatment they needed, and being abused. And so um, I think what that really taught me was that Often you have to believe that the impossible is possible. And that sometimes you have to really follow your heart and you have to step out and take steps that sometimes um, you think you're being told um, are not going to be workable and are in your best interest. So how can we best involve families? I think by really working to share and understand their experience by digging in and really listening and helping them to understand that we get where they're at in their pain and in their grief and being overwhelmed, all of those things. And then from there, providing them with the resources that they need to be able to move forward and to become best advocates, not only for their loved ones, but for others in systems or just even helping to move their family into um, a better place so that they're ready to take their juvenile back into their home. We have to empower families to see beyond their own circumstance, and that is the one thing that I have found that has been most helpful. Often families are so focused on their loved one and only their circumstance that they don't realize There are other people around them who could use support, who could use encouragement, that they could reach out to and network and build this support system that is so needed for families when they have um, a youth that enters the system. And this, in turn, will help them to, to begin to share the stories out, and this creates community and builds momentum for campaigns and for movements. And then the other thing that I often do, because I have families, again, who come to me and say, well, I can't make a difference. There's no use of me even trying, um, you know, to email into the system or to do whatever it is that I'm recommending that they do. And and so then I stop and I share some of the stories of families, and I'm going to be doing some of that Um, with you, but sharing the stories of the change that we have actually been able to bring, the tangible um, circumstances, the examples that that we're able to give, and then they get it and they understand that, yes, this has been done in the past and it can work. Um, Certainly it doesn't always work, but 
again, trying something is better than trying nothing. And then I think making sure that you provide also, um, in addition to teaching them how to become advocates, but also providing the resources, data, research, and white papers on what it is that you're wanting them to help move forward um, certainly em- empowers them. So we did this first letter writing campaign, and my son came out, and he only made it three months. Um, again, very long story, but he wound up back in the prison system after three months. We couldn't get him psychiatric hospitalization because he'd been with adult prisoners. And so he asked to go to jail. He had a breakdown. They put him back in prison. Um, when he went back in prison this time, um, he um, wound up in long-term segregation. And that was one of my greatest fears. And once he wound up in long-term segregation, and I started looking around and I saw how many of these prisoners were alone, whose families had walked away, often because they're overwhelmed or because they're afraid to advocate. They don't know how to do it, so they've walked away. And I looked around, and I I also reached out, and I um, started learning about some of those who had actually lost their lives in solitary confinement, and that was the fear of my son. So I met the mother of Timothy Souders that you see here in the photo who died after 72 hours of being restrained. I learned about Jeffrey Clark, who died um, from having his water shut off. He was schizophrenic. And then um, the man in the upper right-hand corner who died from starvation. Again, they all had mental illness, significant mental illness. And we decided to do another letter-writing campaign. And um, at that point, it was a new governor, new legislators. And at that point, I had also organized and met a lot of other families. I had reached out and networked, and I was working along and collaborating with a lot of other organizations. So we did another huge send out, and we had many more people who were writing, and we continued on with um, pounding um, their offices with letters. And... um, So then the photo in the very right-hand corner is the photograph that I got out of my son um, when I knew what he was explaining was four- and five-point restraints, which they said were no longer used in the system. We did the letter-writing campaign before I got the photograph out, but it's just um, to show you that these things really do happen inside systems, and it is why it's important for um, families and organizations to use our voices to work to bring change for all of those um, who are inside of, of systems. This all led to the creation of Citizens for Prison Reform. We began just bringing families together, and families said, we want to continue to meet on a monthly basis. We um, sought and got our nonprofit status in 2011, and we've continued to meet on a monthly basis since that time. Primarily, we're made up of families who have someone in the system or who have had someone in the system, and we provide educational support at these meetings. So some of the other outcomes that have occurred um, after our second letter writing campaign, and and I have to actually share with you that I worked, I started working closely with the department. I was taught how to email in both at, at the prison level and then to central office and to email those who were in charge of my son's care. He spent another nine months in long term segregation. Um, and was taken seven hours away, so it was very challenging. But I think the thing that I learned is that you must never give up. You must continue to stick to what you know and you believe is the truth, and the truth is that families deserve and need to be included and engaged and at the table helping to make decisions Um, and not being walled off from helping to create policy and look at policy and looking at what is best for the family unit. What we have to remember is these youth, all of these people, most all of them will come back out and will live in the family unit. 
And so we really have to work to engage the families and provide that support and work as a team and as a collaborative throughout the process. If we don't do that, we all know that the chances of them making it once they're back into that home setting um, are much less. And so I continued to um, email and send in um, just really asking that they bring families to the table, uh, really making my points to the fact that families need to have their voices heard, that this system um, hugely impacts families. And so I got the department to agree to holding family meetings and we began meeting over some general issues that were affecting all 44-plus thousand families here in Michigan who had someone in the adult system. And it was then at that time that I decided to apply for the Soros Fellowship. I wanted to begin working more closely in the prisons. Um, so, you know, the department actually had come to despise me because of the fact that I had taken those photos I'd gone to the Detroit Free Press. We went public. The Rock Center came out, and Ted Koppel interviewed my son. He was actually released in 2012, and I believe largely in part because of the level at which I advocated. Um, I can tell you that all of the other juveniles that I shared in this PowerPoint, none of them are out, and most all of them are past their earliest release date in the system. So... The Ted Koppel special was aired back in 2012, and it was on juveniles across the nation in isolation. And the department, in so many ways, despised me, yet they continued to listen and to respond and to correspond with me about these family meetings and continuing to hold them periodically. Um, it was a very difficult process, but I never gave up. I continued to go to them and continued to let them know that this is what families really need and deserve. And so after um, I decided to apply for the fellowship, I went in and I met with them. And amazingly enough, they were very supportive of the Family Participation Program and, in fact, wrote my letter of recommendation. So it really was was a 180 from where we had been to coming to this spot where they opened up and allowed four pilot prisons to be a part of the project and the information about the program and the resources that are available for families are available now inside of those prisons. They then agreed, the director agreed most recently in January to create a pilot family advisory board that meets quarterly with the department. And currently we are moving through their information packet and making recommendations um, for changes to their packet to make it more family friendly. Some of the other things that we have accomplished through engaging families has been the creation of our own resource guide and we created that um, before the Department of Corrections had anything available on their website for families. You had to dig in to find anything, and we just recognized that families needed this. So we were able to involve families in this work and bring in their ideas and, again, engage them in actually doing something that was tangible, and I think that made a huge difference. We then started sharing our stories with legislators, taking families in to meet not only with the Department of Corrections to push on these issues, but as well to legislative members and explain that there was nothing on their site. And so we had some legislators who then mandated and put it in the boilerplate that the Department of Corrections had to create and make available online a family information packet. The next thing that we began to address was, uh, was a standardized authorization form for prisoners to sign <clears throat> that would give families access to known medical or mental health crises. And again, the legislators picked that up and mandated that. And we are still working on some things with that, but we have come a long ways. And then the last thing is a reduction um, by the director 
Um, they, they had had a policy of taking away visits for two years to life for someone who had substance abuse tickets. And um, this is just quickly I want to share. This is Tiffany that you see on the left-hand corner. She came to me very broken, sobbing a mess. She said she had been looking for years for someone to help her, and the National Alliance on Mental Illness sent her my way. She came to me because she found out her brother was going to have a parole hearing, and, and he was telling her that she needed to be there, and she was afraid. She didn't know what to do. He has schizophrenia. He's in the psychiatric prison. She went on to share that they hadn't been able to have a visit in four years because of that substance abuse policy. And so I helped Tiffany get through the the parole hearing deal that was a very urgent uh, one-day turnaround time. And then we began to work on this bigger issue. And I assisted her and have taught her how to email into that warden, into the mental health staff. And um, then we created this document that we've now been sharing out with legislators, and we're hoping that they're going to change the administrative rule on this um, for Michigan law. But here's a picture of Tiffany that we took and shared out because we did accomplish getting a return visit in March. Um, and we are working to get their visits restored permanently. But these are the kinds of stories that really make a difference. And now Tiffany is a very strong advocate showing up at our legislative days and working with legislators, uh, again, to um, share not only her story, but how many other families are affected by this. So I think some of the recommendations that um, I really would like to, to offer up are um, from the three different viewpoints. So as families, it's very important to network with organizations and stakeholders. Never work alone. You, you really are at risk when you do that, um, often of being seen as the problem. I think that's often how I felt. Um, in dealing with the juvenile um, system was I was seen as the problem. They weren't used to having families engaged, and so you need to really collaborate and have the support of other families and do it together. And also building bridges in with systems that often we see as opponents. Um, so I really came to the conclusion that it was very important for me to work with the Department of Corrections and not see them as an opponent, but as an ally, and find the common threads where we could work together. And um, it certainly is, is much more helpful than building walls. For those of you who are from organizations or agencies, making sure that you're creating room at the table for families, collaborating with them, giving them specific roles and, and ways that they can um, bring their perspective to the table and to be heard and see that they're making a difference and seeing them as being um, an equal at the table and not lesser than. I think creating resource guides and useful, accessible tools for families, documents, the information that you're constantly having to get out, creating that for them, making it accessible is, is a huge step. Um, that families really need and can utilize those tools. And then also teaching families how to become their own best advocates. Up front, I used to do a lot of the work for families, and I have learned that it is so important to empower families to teach and show them how to do the work. And yes, of course, we have families who don't have um, computers. They don't have the access. But what I often do is say to them, okay, think about, do you have friends? Do you have family who have computers where you could go and access and they could teach you some of these things and they can show you the websites where the resources are available? And they often do. And the really um, fabulous piece to that is that I then have created involvement of family and friends who are hopefully going to become a support to them as well. So it's really spreading the work out and creating that collaboration um, in the extend, their extended world. And for systems, again, I think making room for families at the, at the table, making sure that you are really open to collaboration, 
um, being transparent in the work that you're doing and communicating clearly. Communication is huge. Um, Again, offering up resource guides and um, materials, even the supports out in the community, you know, if they're electric bill shut off, where can they go to get the help? Creating um, a a manual for them of how they can access within their community the things that they might need. And then offering educational trainings and resources, and in particular around dealing with the trauma, um, you know, offering up trauma-informed supports and assistance for them in dealing with their grief and their pain and the brokenness that it creates in families when they have someone removed remove from their home. So I think with that, we can open it up to questions. Thanks, Lois. Um, I just want to remind everybody that the chat box is uh, how we are going to receive uh, your questions today. So please feel free to send your message either privately to myself or to everybody so we can um, see everyone's questions. Um, Lois, I have a question for you. So you mentioned, um, you know, the, the advocates that you've trained and, um, you know, you're, you're so clearly uh, an effective advocate yourself. I hear people ask a lot um, in the work that we do in states, well, how do I find the Loises of the world? Like, we don't have a Lois in our state or, you know, I don't know where the Loises are. What would you say, um, you know, how, what would you say to folks about, like, how to find the Loises? Uh, how do you build the Loises? What do you do to get Loises? How do you engage Lois? So I think really utilizing social media, utilizing um, the media in general, and trying to get some stories out um, around in communities or statewide. Um, And that's really how I was able to find some of those very passionate family members that are now serving as family-to-family advocates. Um, because of the the media and the stories that that were put out around the family participation program, doing work to get your your work publicized, uh, getting it out there, really can bring those families who maybe have been thinking in in the back of their mind that they know this is needed, but they don't yet feel empowered to make it happen. So I think that is one way, Um, but also as you have families calling in, really um, taking note of those families, meeting with them, again, taking the time to connect with about what is their story, and really looking at what could they possibly bring to the table. Often it may be just getting the word out um, about your work and you know, frequently I will say, you know, you could really help just by letting other families know about the family participation program. It gives them purpose and makes them um, really feel empowered. But you begin to see those families that are going to be there for the long haul and that are leaders and that really um, will be good at organizing. And you start to recognize who they are um, and you're able to draw them in. You also mentioned Lois kind of in the course of us preparing for this um, presentation that, you know, sometimes families feel like this is um, kind of a short term situation for themselves and their child and they're kind of hesitant to get involved. Can you talk a little bit more about um, maybe how to engage those families or, um, you know, have you seen any success in doing so? Um, Yes. Well, in the juvenile system, again, I I really did not have the experience in doing this level of engagement. It really has occurred for me with the adult system. But even, even with the adult system, 
Often I see the families who are dealing with a one- or two-year sentence, and they know their loved one will most likely be coming out. It's often um, more difficult to get them to commit to doing this work on a deeper level. Um, But there are certain families who really, uh, when they come and they're so overwhelmed, they don't have the information or the knowledge that they need, and we offer up our resources to them, they say, wow, I want to get involved. I want to start helping other families. So, um, you know, it really, it comes by doing that work, also by sending out information to them letting them know about upcoming events, and letting them know that you are needing help, that you are wanting to create an engagement um, forum in a in a platform for families. And so I think often they may not even think of that. Again, they're often focused on their own, but you've got to open up their mind to understand that it goes beyond just taking care of their own if we're going to bring system change. And certainly there are some families that, you know, aren't aren't going to buy in, and it, it is challenging. Some of them um, really don't feel that they can make the commitment. They, they have a whole lot going on in their own homes. But um, I think it's been clear to me the more I I have reached out um, and made it clear to families that I am really needing some help and support, that I can't do this alone, that they will come on board. And I think also um, having a clear list of different ways, different things that families can do to become um, involved, different levels of commitment so that even for someone who maybe can't commit for a real long um, term, having something that they can do in a short term and it gets them involved and it helps them understand that they are important, their voice is important, and that they can make a difference. Uh, Lois, we have a question that came through on the chat room. Um, uh, how how did you identify other families to connect with when you did uh, finally, you know, kind of have that epiphany about, oh, I need mm-hmm. to get, you know, connected with other folks? Well, I, I'd like to go back and share. So when my son was at the detention facility, um, you know, I certainly did not experience um, a level of welcomeness. We, in fact, were told we couldn't be there when the psychiatrist met with my son, um, that we weren't allowed to be a part of that meeting with the psychiatrist. On top of that, I remember feeling, and I see this often in the prison system, too, that we would be lined up coming in, getting ready to sign in for visits, and I would try to start having some conversation with families just about the stressors of the circumstance. And many of them felt very much afraid to talk. Um, There was a sense, again, of that there could be retaliation for us connecting and supporting each other. So I personally believe um, that that is one of the ways um, in detention facilities that we need to, number one, Systems should be required and need to be offering family support groups. Um, Organizations and agencies as well could come on and be organizing those and making that happen. Um, If it's families that are needing to do that, um, it is going to be more challenging, but I think you really would have to connect with families who have experienced someone in the system, possibly, again, building bridges in and going and meeting here in Michigan, county commissioners are the purse strings to juvenile detention facilities, and they really set the parameters for each county. So going and meeting with those people, taking somebody with you, and a couple of families going and talking about this and how this is something that you want and you see needs to happen, um, going um, you know, to your county officials, really, um, is, is one way that you could make it happen. Thanks, Lois. Uh, Another question coming through before we start to wrap up here. Have you experienced any success tackling the issue of the lack of affordable, accessible transportation to institutions so families can have face-to-face visits? 
No, I I have not. And again, my experience with this is not in the juvenile system. Um, my hope and dream is in the next year that we are going to be expanding this um, program and that we're going to have a couple of pilot detention facilities on board. And, you know, that is an issue that I certainly am, am very concerned about. In the adult system, I can tell you that there really is very little help and support, and families here in Michigan have to drive as far as 12 hours to go and visit a loved one in the prison system, um, which means an overnight stay, gas, food, and um, it, it becomes basically unaffordable for most families. So I think it is something that we need to look at and address. I would like to learn what is occurring in the juvenile facilities. Um, I do know of a private facility here in Michigan I'm, I'm concerned about. I actually had the opportunity to go with the legislative member and visit this private facility. And the thing that concerned me was that they only allowed for 10-minute visits once on the weekend. And, you know, I mean, you've got families who might be driving four or five hours to get there and to only have a 10-minute visit to me clearly is not engaging the family. So I think a lot of issues to be addressed around that. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions? Um, if, if not, uh, I would like to, you know, thank our presenter, Lois, uh, for being such a wonderful resource to us um, here at the campaign, but to others. Lois, um, I noticed you did not provide your contact information. Uh, would you mind uh, giving folks, um, well, I can add it to this PowerPoint at the end and send it out, um, but if you want to make your email available to folks if they have other questions. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry I did not do that. Um, so you can email me at familyparticipationprogram at gmail.com. Familyparticipationprogram at gmail.com. So I just want to thank all the participants and uh, again to you, Lois, uh, for being our expert here today. Remember, folks, you can call me uh, for one-on-one -on -one assistance about this particular topic if you want to drill down a little bit more or have a specific question or need that wasn't addressed by today's presentation. Uh, but we appreciate your um, willingness to learn with us and hope that you all took something away from this. Um, uh, it looks like a question just came in uh, through email, so I don't want to miss the opportunity to ask that. Uh, so let me just backtrack here a little bit and um, um, uh, it looks like a parent, uh, Lois, wants to know how to connect uh, with folks from, another, from other states. So um, she's currently residing in Louisiana, but her son is in Texas. Um, is there any advice that you would have to keep that connection? Um, and is there a way for families to have uh, connections to be able to bring together in a case like that? Yes. Well, I can tell you I've, I've met, I have a, a lot of networks. So um, if you email me, but if you Google, I know that there are some very strong grassroots organizers in Texas um, that are um, dealing with the juvenile system. In particular, the adult system, I'm pretty sure I could also assist in finding. Now, there are some states where there really is no one doing this work, really a direct service for families. But I do know in the juvenile system in Texas of at least one very strong group. So I would certainly um, offer to connect you with them. But I think sometimes, you know, that's the difficulty for me was just in searching and trying to find the other organizations. And often with families um, that I deal with in the adult system, it's been amazing. I do a show of hands at these family gatherings that I'm holding where I'm training families in how to use the resources. And 
really, uh, really most of them do not know of any other organizations. They are totally disconnected. They have not been utilizing the Michigan Department of Corrections website. So it's really sad um, to see. You know, uh, sometimes it's just um, overwhelming, I guess, to go out and look for the information. Thanks, Lois, um, for addressing that. So just in closing, again, uh, this is Jessica Sandoval at the Campaign for Youth Justice. I can be reached at jsandoval at cfyj or on my direct phone line at 202-821-1605. I've put some resources in the chat box if anybody's interested in um, listening to a previous webinar on the transforming the justice system by partnering with families uh, that was done by OJDP as well as the Family Comes First workbook for system stakeholders. Um, I, again, want to thank everyone. Thanks so much. And we're going to go ahead and conclude this meeting now. Thank you.